Rules Committee will come to order. Uh, today, the committee is meeting to consider two measures which are focused on taking reasonable, responsible action in support of gun safety. First, let me say uh, what these bills are not. These are not attempts to take away guns or to punish law-abiding gun owners or to undermine the Second Amendment. Instead, the bills before us are about doing what Congress is supposed to do, listening to the will of the people and taking action to solve problems of the nation. One such problem, gun violence, has robbed the American people of their safety virtually everywhere they go. Where our children learn, where our families buy groceries, where our friends and neighbors pray, where the sick go to heal. Just recently, 10 innocent people in Buffalo, New York, were gunned down while shopping in a supermarket by a self-proclaimed white supremacist. And then came the shooting at Robb Elementary in Uvalde, Texas. I have to tell you, like a lot of you, before I'm a congressman, I'm a parent. Watching the parents of the innocent children killed that day, I can't even imagine. They had, to, they had to submit DNA because the bodies of their fourth graders were unrecognizable. Then I think of trauma they had to go through, burying their own kids, explaining to their brothers and sisters why they are never coming home. The pain as more news trickles out about what could have been done differently, knowing that this could have been prevented. I come up empty. When I try to understand how we could let something like this happen and not take some kind of action, I come up empty. Parents are literally frozen with fear that their child will be next, caught in the crosshairs of the next mass shooting. And you know what? As badly as I want to comfort them, I can't. I can't look them in the eye and tell them that it won't happen to their community. Because it could happen anywhere, and that makes me sick. America is an outlier. Other countries face mental health challenges, have video games, have gun owners, have crime. But only here in America, where it's harder to get a driver's license than it is to buy a gun in some places, do we have constant mass shootings. In 2022, we've had over 200, and it's only June. Oh, look, the Second Amendment matters but so does our responsibility as leaders to protect the lives of our constituents. These are not mutually exclusive. What are we doing here if it's not to protect the lives of kids from getting shot at school? What is the point of being here if we can't even muster the courage to do that? So it's not the American people stopping us. They get it. They get that some guns are for hunting and self-defense and some guns are for killing as many people as quickly as possible. They get that if a court says you are an extreme risk to yourself or others, you shouldn't be walking around with a firearm. They understand that, if, they understand that it should be against federal law to leave guns lying around the house if you have kids around. They know that if you're caught trafficking firearms, you ought to be punished severely. The measures before us offer sensible solutions that a clear, convincing, in fact, overwhelming majority of voters agree with. As a country, our leaders, including all of us here in this room, are responsible for making choices. If we do nothing, we are making a choice. We are choosing to be powerless. We are choosing to do nothing to stop the next mass shooting from happening on our watch. So this isn't about being pro-gun or anti-gun. This is about being anti-gun violence and pro-gun safety. So I hope and I pray that some of my colleagues on the other side feel the same way and will join us in this effort to protect the lives of our constituents. With that, I'm happy to turn to our ranking member, Mr. Cole, for any comments he wishes to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing covers two items, both of which are packages of gun control bills. Before I continue, I'd like to express my deep shock and horror, particularly at the event uh, two weeks ago in Uvalde, Texas. Uh, Nineteen children, two teachers lost their lives as a result of a despicable act of mass violence. I know every member of this committee joins me in mourning with the community and praying for the families, friends, and loved ones of the victims. It's easy to understand the outrage, the anger, 
and the frustration that emerges after events like these. Mass shootings like the one in Uvalde and the one three weeks ago in Buffalo and more recently in Tulsa, my own home state of Oklahoma, are happening all too often. I understand the desire to do something, anything, to make these tragedies stop. Sadly, the causes of these events are deeply complex and do not break down easily into a single soundbite. Our nation is in the midst of a widespread mental health crisis. The growing number and frequency of mass shootings are a reminder that our country must take a comprehensive public health approach to gun violence that addresses uh, culture, mental illness, gun safety, and regulations that also respect the Second Amendment. But unfortunately, the measures before us today do not meet that test. Instead of offering a well-reasoned approach, they are sound bites, nothing more. While our colleagues in the Senate are working together and actually negotiating on a package that has a chance of becoming law, the majority today is putting forward messaging bills that stand no chance of passing the Senate and no chance of becoming law. I would remind my colleagues on the committee that contrary to the majority's rhetoric, Republicans have taken real concrete steps to address gun violence in a way that also respects the Second Amendment. In the 115th Congress, we worked together to pass the Fix Nix Act, which strengthened the existing National Instant Criminal Background Check System, or NICS. Uh, in 2019, the Trump administration issued regulations to ban bump stocks. We've consistently supported funding for enhancing mental health services across the country, both in our annual appropriations bills and as part of the CARES Act in 2020. But there is more to be done. Sadly, the policy proposals the majority is advancing today are misguided. I believe all efforts to address violent crime and mass shootings must be deliberative and open to ensure they are effective and that the constitutional rights are preserved for all Americans. Uh, they should respect the cultural differences between California and Texas, New York and Oklahoma. They should protect the rights of the 99.9% of, the of gun owners who are law-abiding citizens rather than imposing collective punishment on everyone for the sins of a few, horrible though those sins may be. But instead of pursuing that course, the majority is instead moving a variety of bills that will limit the rights and due processes of law-abiding gun owners. They are seeking to impose regulations from Washington that will limit the rights of everyone. That's deeply unfortunate. The first package I'll discuss, H.R. 2377, establishes a federal procedure for the extreme risk protection orders, or so-called red flag law. This bill, if enacted into law, would allow individuals to seek out a court order requiring a firearms owner to surrender his or her firearms if the court finds the firearm owner, uh, owner poses a risk to themselves or to others. Many states have enacted red flag laws in recent years, and it should remain up to the states to do so if they can do so in a way that protects due process rights and the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens. It should not be for Washington to impose such laws on states that neither want nor need them. Unfortunately, H.R. 2377 does just that. Not only does it impose a one-size-fits-all regime on everyone, but my Republican colleagues on the Judiciary Committee have expressed concerns that the bill provides insufficient due process protections for respondents. As such, the bill may violate the due process protections contained in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. They are insufficient mechanisms to protect respondents from unscrupulous individuals seeking to harass otherwise responsible gun owners. And this is particularly concerning given the significant legal bills that may result from defending against frivolous applications. The majority's other package, H.R. 7910, encompasses eight bills. These include measures that are duplicative, uh, like the title of the bill banning bump stocks, which are already banned under federal law. The bill fails to take into account the needs of hunters including subsistence hunters who rely on these weapons to feed themselves and their families. And it includes no exceptions for those who need firearms for their own security. I would uh, remind my colleagues that while police in big cities may have short response times, in rural parts of the country, like the areas that I represent, police may be 30 minutes or an hour away. Citizens have the right to protect themselves, and they have the expectation that they will be able to do so when the police cannot get to them. This bill would limit that right and may have 
the impact of preventing law-abiding citizens from being able to defend themselves in times of emergency or crisis. My colleagues on the Judiciary Committee have expressed additional concerns about both of these packages, which I appreciate the opportunity to hear more about today. Mr. Chairman, while I understand the compulsion to do something, anything, in the light of the tragic events in recent weeks, I believe these bills are deeply misguided. We would be better served to address the root causes of these tragedies, our national mental health crisis, and to take a measured, common-sense approach to guns that keeps them out of the hands of wrongdoers but also respects the rights of law-abiding citizens. Our constituents and our Constitution demand no less. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chairman Nadler. McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of H.R. 2377, the Federal Extreme Risk Protection Order Act of 2021, and H.R. 7910, the Protecting Our Kids Act. Our nation has been through trying times these last few weeks as we have tried to process the mass shootings in Buffalo, Valde, Tulsa, and all too many other cities. Just this past weekend, we learned of yet another hor horrible incident in Philadelphia, and yet more carnage in Tennessee, Arizona, Virginia, and South Carolina. And those were just the stories we saw in the news. Day after day, we see more lives lost to gun violence in our schools, on our streets, in our houses of worship, and in our homes, touching every region of the country. And we hear the urgent calls from our constituents crying out for us to take action. Today, I am pleased to bring forward two bills that would heed their call. H.R. 2377, the Federal, Risk Protect, Federal Extreme Risk Protection Order Act, introduced by Representative Lucy McBath, authorizes federal courts to issue an extreme risk protection order, or, or ERPO, otherwise known as a red flag law, temporarily removing firearms from a person in crisis and preventing them from purchasing additional firearms. The bill also includes Representative Salud Carbayal's legislation that provides funding to states to enact ERPO statutes of their own. H.R. 2377 would take meaningful steps to prevent gun violence and tragedies in our communities, while at the same time protecting the due process rights of those individuals in crisis. An order would only be issued after a court made a determination that there is evidence demonstrating that the person poses a significant danger of injuring himself, himself, or others. Federal courts are the constitutional bastions of due process, and accordingly, this legislation includes strong due process provisions that strike the appropriate balance between protecting the rights of the gun owner and ensuring community safety. We know that extreme risk laws save lives. Post-event investigations of mass shootings suggest that ERPOs and risk warrants can play a role in preventing these incidents, since nearly 80% of perpetrators of mass violence in public places make explicit threats or behave in a manner indicative of their intent to carry out an attack. We have also witnessed their effectiveness in state after state, beginning in 2016, when California passed the first such law. Since then, 18 other states and the District of Columbia have enacted similar laws. H.R. 7910, the Protecting Our Kids Act, is a comprehensive bill that would employ a variety of strategies to effectively reduce gun violence across the country by raising the age that certain semi-automatic firearms can lawfully be possessed, limiting the accessibility of large capacity magazines, prohibiting straw purchasing, promoting the safe storage of firearms, and building on existing regulations to take ghost guns and bump stocks out of our community. And I noticed that uh, uh, the ranking member mentioned that uh, President Trump instituted the bump stock ban, uh, and, and he said that this would be a redundant because it's already the law. It's not a law. It's a regulation. This would codify into law the regulation that President Trump uh, initiated. Representative Anthony Brown's Raise the Age Act would raise the lawful age to purchase an AR-15 dialed semi-automatic assault, semi assault rifle 
from 18 to 21 years old. In deeply red Wyoming, the state with the most guns per capita in the union, this is already the law with respect to many firearms. And I note with great sadness that the suspected shooters in both Buffalo and Duvalde were only 18 years of age. Representative Robin Kelly's Prevent Gun Trafficking Act would establish new federal offenses for gun trafficking and straw purchasing. Problems that she is as familiar with in Chicago as we are in New York, where the vast majority of firearms used in criminal activity are transported into the city through the iron pipeline from states with less restrictive gun laws. These guns are illegal to be purchased in New York or Illinois, but they come in illegally from states where they are legal to be sold. Representative David Cicilline's Untraceable Firearms Act would ensure that ghost guns are subject to existing federal firearms regulations. A deadly weapon is a deadly weapon, even if you build it from a kit in your garage. A trio of gun storage proposals, Representative Rosa DeLauro's Ethan's Law, Representative Lisa Slotkin's Safe Guns, Safe Kids Act, and Representative Sheila Jackson Lee's Kimberly Vaughan Firearm Safe Storage Act would establish voluntary best practices for safe firearm storage and award grants for firearm storage assistance programs. There are nearly 400 million firearms in America today. We should at least ensure that they are stored safely and away from our children. Representative Dina Titus's Closing the Bump Stock Loophole Act would build on existing regulations banning the manufacture, sale, or possession of bump stocks for civilian use. Remember that the Trump administration first enacted this ban to convert semi-automatic weapons into machine guns and serve no purpose other than to maximize carnage, as we learned when they were used in a deadly shooting in Las Vegas that killed 58 people in 2018. And as I said, this would make it law. Finally, Representative Ted Deutsch's Keep American Safe Act would ban the sale, manufacture, and illegal possession of gun magazines that hold more than 15 rounds of ammunition. High-capacity magazines are designed for mass killing and have been the accessory of choice in some of the bloodiest shootings in our history, including the 2007 shooting at Virginia Tech and the 1999 shooting at Columbine High School. As we address the scourge of gun violence, a blight that killed 45,000 Americans in 2020 alone let us remember that there are no perfect solutions. We are painfully aware that we cannot do enough to save every life and that there is no one answer that will solve this problem. But the proposals contained in the two bills we are considering today, when taken for, together, would make a meaningful difference and would save countless lives. And I want to comment on something the ranking member said when he talked about mental health. The United States has many, many times the rate of gun violence than other similarly developed countries like the UK or Australia or, or Canada, or for that matter, Germany. Our people are not four or five, 20 times as mentally ill as people in those countries. The one difference is that in this country, we have 400 million guns. In those countries, they have relatively few guns. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, um, Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole and the members of the committee for allowing me to testify on this bill, this series of bills. Mr. Chairman, we're all at a loss of words when it comes to the horrific tragedies that played out in Buffalo and Uvalde over the past couple of weeks. We should be working together to keep our schools and our neighborhoods safe. But we can't keep people safe by limiting law-abiding citizens' right to self-defense and assaulting Americans' constitutional rights. The, the gun bills that are presented here today uh, all suffer a common flaw that almost all gun control suffers from, and that is criminals don't obey the law. Good guys obey the law, they'll disarm in a gun-free zone, and then that's those are the types of places that the criminals seek out. The chairman said that these bills are not an attempt to take away people's guns, but in reality, these bills will take all guns from some people and some guns from all people. And predominantly, it will limit law-abiding citizens' access to guns. So if the goal is, is to reduce access to, to firearms, well, that, that might be accomplished in these bills, but it's not going to reduce criminals or the, or the uh, mentally insane access to firearms. 
Let me start with H.R. 2377. It would deprive citizens of their firearms without due process of law. You don't have to be an adherent to the Second Amendment or even uh, believe what the Founding Fathers believed about the Second Amendment to know that H.R. 2377 is a bad bill because it violates the, the 14th Amendment and the Fifth Amendment and the base text of the Constitution because it turns due process on its head. By depriving individuals of their property and rights without having been charged, arraigned, or convicted of a crime, this bill violates those due process rights. This bill would flip due process on its head. The accused person is deprived of the opportunity of defense or the ability to cross-examine the accuser in a red flag law. After the government seizes the property, the individual would be forced to spend a considerable amount of time and resources on a defense without ever being accused of a crime. And if an individual mounts a successful defense, the difficulty of having the seized property returned remains a tremendous burden that falls upon the defendant because this bill has no requirement that the property be returned within a reasonable period of time. More troubling, this bill is predicated simply on the belief of third parties. Your abusive ex-spouse would now have a mechanism to get the government to take away your firearms. While the bill is introduced and considered by Judiciary, Judiciary Committee dealt exclusively with federal extreme risk protection orders, otherwise known as red flag laws, the bill we are considering today expands it to include a new and more troubling component. The new provision, which the Judiciary Committee never considered, would bribe the states to enact substantially similar extreme risk protection order laws. But the state grant program is much more pernicious than the proposed federal procedure. Under the federal proposal, only household or family members and law enforcement may petition a court for an order to disarm a law-abiding American. The new grant program, however, authorizes the states to determine who can initiate those actions. That could include a disgruntled employee or an angry neighbor. The federal proposal indicates that the court must find probable cause that the respondent possess a risk of imminent personal injury to self or another individual by possessing a firearm. But for a state to be eligible to receive a grant, the bill only requires that the respondent poses a danger of causing harm to self or others by possessing a firearm. There is no requirement that the harm be imminent and that the court, and the court only need to make that finding on a reasonable cause to believe, not probable cause. There are other significant discrepancies as well, including the timeline for the opportunity to be heard and the duration of the orders. I'm at a loss to understand these discrepancies, unless, of course, the purpose of these bills is to create as many avenues as possible to disarm law-abiding Americans. The other side may argue this bill is necessary to keep firearms out of the hands of individuals suffering from mental illness, but this bill does nothing to actually address mental illness. All 50 states already have laws on the books. They've studied this problem They've litigated it, they've legislated it, and they all have laws on the books. In Florida, they're called, it's called the Baker Act. In California, it's called 5150. But every state has them and has had them for many years. The difference between the state laws and the new red flag laws in some of these states and the new federal red flag proposal is that the state laws that already exist require that a mental health professional be involved. And the red flag laws do not have that requirement. It's just how does the, the judge feel about it? Uh, the state laws require that a, an attorney be paid for if the defendant can't afford it. And the state laws provide help to the person who has mental health issues. These red flag laws, they, are, they don't help the situation. You go in, you take property away from an individual who you say is under mental uh, stress or may be a harm to himself or others, but then you don't provide any help to that individual. For example, New York authorizes commitment for individuals who pose a substantial threat of harm to self or others. New York also has one of the most extensive red flag laws on the books in this country. Yet a year before his killing spree, the Buffalo shooter indicated that he wanted to commit murder-suicide at his high school. And even after a psychological evaluation and referral to police, authorities took no further action. If these red flag laws worked, we would see evidence in states that already have them. But the reality is they just don't. 
What we do see in these states are thousands of law-abiding citizens who have their firearms taken away, and then they don't have the resources, in some cases upwards of $10,000, to, to go back and get their due process after this, what some people call a rapid due process, which frankly does not exist in this circumstance, um, has already occurred. There's, I mean, there's, there are similar problems with the other massive gun control uh, bills or the package that the Democrats rushed through the committee last week. H.R. 7910 is a grab bag of radical Democrat proposals that will restrict American Second Amendment rights without any evidence that it will make anything better. You can't take six bills that aren't going to work and put them together and make a big bill that will work. None of them on their own will work. The, each of them on their own is dangerous to the rights of law-abiding citizens. But when you put them all together, it doesn't make a good bill. It would unconstitutionally limit the constitutional rights for young adults to purchase certain firearms. For instance, you can be, you have to sign up for selective service because you can be conscripted into the defense of this country at the age of 18, 19, or 20, yet you will be deprived of your right to keep and bear arms, substantially deprived. Don't take my word for it. Even the liberal Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals recently struck down a similar California law as unconstitutional. The court overturned a California law banning the sale of long guns and semi-automatic center rifles to anyone under 21 years old as a severe burden on the core Second Amendment right of self-defense in the home. And th this is being discussed, one of the provisions in this is being discussed as an assault weapons ban for 18, 19, and 20 year olds. The reality is it bans all modern rifles and all modern shotguns. If they're semi-automatic center fire, there's nothing about assault weapon in this bill. If it takes a detachable magazine and it's semi-automatic and it's not a squirrel gun, you can't have it under this bill. There's nothing about assault rifle in here. In a concurrence on the under 21 ruling in the Ninth Circuit, one judge wrote separately to emphasize how California's legal position has no logical stopping point and would ultimately erode fundamental rights enumerated in our Constitution. In addition, the bill's safe storage requirements make it harder to access a firearm in an emergency. This is exactly the kind of provision criminals love. They, they know if they bust into a law-abiding homeowner's uh, house, that person is going to take at least 90 seconds to retrieve that firearm from, from something that might be considered safe under this bill. Uh, the, bill mandate, the bill's mandates do not reflect the realities of firearm ownership in America, especially in rural areas, and will make it more difficult for a firearm owner to access the firearm in an emergency when seconds count. And the firearms trafficking title has a flaw in it that w was uh, borne out in the hearing in the markup in judiciary. I've offered an amendment to try and fix the flaw. The, the uh, arms trafficking title within the um, larger 7910 bill would make it harder for a victim of domestic violence to keep a, a firearm, to obtain and keep a firearm for defense. It's, it proposes this uh, title proposes to make gun trafficking illegal. The thing is, it's already illegal. You can't be a straw purchaser. When you f sign the 4470, 4473 form at an FFL, the very first question you are asked, and you're asked a series of questions, and you, you're committing perjury uh, if you lie on this form, and you, it says you will be convicted of a felony if you do this. You, the first question is, are you buying this firearm for yourself? Or are you planning to buy this for somebody else? So uh, being a straw purchaser is already illegal. What this gun trafficking provision does is it makes it also, it doubles the crime from five years to 10 years, but it makes the receiver of the, of the uh, firearm also complicit in gun trafficking. Well, if you're a domestic abuse uh, victim and you ask your good Samaritan neighbor, can you help me get a gun? And your neighbor gets you a gun, to add insult to injury, you can now be convicted of gun trafficking. I offered a very s simple, reasonable, I thought, uh, exception to gun trafficking for domestic violence victims. We have, uh, the Democrats have exceptions in there for family members already. They have exceptions in there for uh, business associates. Why not have an exception for domestic violence victims? So uh, that's just one of the many problems. Those are just a few of the many problems with this bill. 
The one-size-fits-all gun restriction bills aren't about public safety. The bills are about limiting America's Second Amendment rights. In fact, Representative Cohen admitted as much during the committee consideration, saying that the Democrats' bill will make it harder for law-abiding Americans to exercise their Second Amendment rights. Chairman Nadler acknowledged that gun restriction legislation would not stop criminals from getting guns. I mean, you can read through the provisions of this. Do you think a criminal is going to abide by the Safe Storage Act? I don't think so. Uh, do you think a 19-year-old gang member is going to be concerned about the age to own a semi-automatic gun? I don't think so. If you watched the committee's markup, you saw that Representative Cicilline made clear that Democrats fundamentally have no respect for Second Amendment rights. I urge an open rule on these extremely flawed bills so that we can try to fix them on the floor and work together, and I yield back balance my time. Thank you very much. I want to thank both of you. Um, let me ask unanimous consent to insert on the record the statement of administration policy um, uh, in support of HR 2377 and in support of HR 7910. Um, you know, um, I, I don't even know where to begin, uh, to be honest with you. Um, you know, the argument that, uh, that criminals don't follow the law essentially is an argument against having any laws. I mean, cr criminals by definition don't follow the laws. Every, every law could be refuted by this argument, and, um, and we would have no laws if we only passed laws that applied to people who followed them. Uh, laws against murder and theft are rarely followed by murderers and thieves. Uh, we have those laws because such people exist. So, I mean, I, I, I mean, What's the point of having any laws by by that rationality? Um, and um, you know, I was while, while you were speaking, uh, Mr. Massey, I I was looking up uh, actually waterfowl hunting regulations, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. That's that's where you're from, um, and it says in Kentucky, no person shall take migratory game birds with a shotgun capable of holding more than three sh shot shells unless it is plugged with a one-piece filler, which is incapable of removal without disassembling the gun. So it's okay to limit capacity in Kentucky to protect ducks. Uh, why can't we limit capacity to protect children? Um, and, you know, the argument that the only way to fight a bad guy with a gun um, is a good guy with a gun. Well, um, you know, in Uvalde, there were seven good guys with guns. And they didn't feel they could go to stop the one bad guy with an AR-15 style assault weapon. I mean, I, I think we all know what an AR-15 assault weapon is capable of doing to a child's body. You know, what a high velocity bullet does. I mean, utter destruction. The children of Uvalde had to be identified, as I said in my opening, uh, by DNA testing because their bodies were unrecognizable. Uh, and let me repeat, seven good guys with a gun couldn't stop this one. The gunman in Buffalo, New York, killed a good guy with a gun. Aaron Salter was a retired Buffalo police officer who worked as a security guard at Tops. He was armed with his gun, attempted to fire at the shooter multiple times, and was still murdered by the gunman who was outfitted in body armor and carried an AR-15. I mean, common sense and logic tell you that more guns, especially those kind of guns, means more gun violence. But if you don't believe common sense or logic, you know, we tested this theory twice in the last month, and 31 people died in these two attacks alone. So maybe, just maybe, we ought to make sure that the bad guy doesn't get the gun to begin with. Um, and, um, you know, I, um, you know, I mean, I mean, I don't know about all of you, uh, but while I was home last week, I, I had people stopping me in supermarkets. I mean, I had people stopping me in restaurants and on the street, uh, parents, mothers and fathers saying, what the hell are you people doing? I mean, what, what does it take for you actually to do something? And by the way, on some of this stuff, like 60, 70, 80% of the American people favor it. But we, we, we are, 
you know, we are living in a country where there's a dictatorship of the minority, where it doesn't matter what the American people want. Uh, all that matters is that we have enough senators to basically uh, deny even a debate or a vote on any of this stuff. So I've heard all these arguments before. We hear it all the time. And I, I have to tell you that um, I appreciate you began your remarks by expressing your thoughts and prayers and your sympathy to the victims and their families. But you, you, you basically spent your entire testimony talking about the inconvenience of these uh, potential laws, you know, on people who want to get access to high-powered weapons. Mm -hmm. And I, and you know, and the 18, yeah, yeah, you, you get, you have to register for the selective service, but when you go into the military, you're required to have training and all kinds of supervision when you get a firearm. By 18 years old, turn 18 years old, you can walk into a gun store and legally purchase an AR-15, but you can't legally have a sip of beer in Texas. I mean, I, I, I am, I, I, I don't get, you know, I, even something like just raising the age to buy those kinds of weapons is controversial. I could tell you that, I, I bet you if you did a poll of parents, uh, they would be, over, I don't, the, the, the polling on this would be through the roof. Um, I don't, don't know too many parents who are itching to have their sons or daughters go and buy a, an AR-15 as soon as they turn 18 years old. So look, we can, you know, I mean, it is, what is disappointing about this is, for me is that nothing seems to have changed. And so we will have this debate, we will go to the floor, we will see whether there are, the senators can come to any kind of agreement on any of the stuff that we're talking about here today. You know, maybe they can, I, I mean, I, I'm under no illusion that we will get what I think is appropriate for this, uh, in the need for this country. But maybe on a, some of these items that we're talking about here today, they will come to agreement. We'll see whether or not, uh, you know, the, the gun lobby gives uh, enough senators permission to allow it to come to a vote in the Senate. But uh, God, I don't know. I, I can't look at people anymore, um, you know, in the, in, straight in the eye and, and you know, and, and, and answer uh, the question like, um, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to finally do something? Uh, because, I mean, I, mean I, th I thought, quite frankly, after Sandy Hook, we would have done something. I didn't do a thing. But you know what? The gun lobby the extremists in the gun lobby. By the way, I mean, most gun owners, I think, favor the stuff that we're talking about here today. But the extremists in the gun lobby, you know what? They'll have the last word and, um, and more children will die. And I, uh, I hope maybe this is the moment that there are enough uh, people in a bipartisan way here that will come together and actually do something. So uh, I yield to... Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I expressed, uh, Mr. Massey, in my opening statement, the package of bills honestly seems to illustrate, and you touched on this, the majority's opposition really to the Second Amendment as much as it does uh, a thoughtful approach to try and deal with violence. Uh, in fact, I understand that several members of the majority in the Judiciary Committee made it plain. They basically just opposed the Second Amendment. Um, so let me ask you this. Does this legislative package respect the Second Amendment rights of Americans? In my opinion, it does not. It uh, virtually extinguishes them for 18, 19, and 20-year-olds. And then, um, as I said in my opening statement, it, it doesn't just extinguish the Second Amendment for some. It violates the, uh, the 14th Amendment and the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution for uh, anybody that's sub subjected to uh, a disgruntled ex, you know, spouse or, or co-worker. Well, Mr. Chairman, what does think Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, with, with all due respect, uh, this, uh, uh, this package of bills most certainly does respect the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment, like any other amendment, establishes rights that are not unlimited. First Amendment gives us freedom of speech, but in Justice Holmes' uh, 
a word. You cannot uh, cry fire in a crowded theater when there's no fire. You certainly can't falsely accuse someone of a crime. And the same thing here. Uh, we're not saying people can't have guns. We are putting certain restrictions designed to promote the public safety. And that is with, well within the ambit of, 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 the, uh, of, of the rights protected by the Second Amendment. Mr. Master, you care to respond to that? Well, we gave them chances to improve this legislation in the committee. Over half a dozen amendments were offered to solve the, the problem, the constitutional problems in the bill, and uh, none of them were adopted per se. Uh, there was one Democrat who did see fit to vote to protect victims of domestic violence, but all the rest voted against it. There's also another constitutional problem with this uh, legislation that the legislation tries to sort of fix inside of itself, and that is that there's nothing in the Constitution that gives the federal government the power to regulate uh, these firearms other than the Interstate Commerce Clause. So I think three or four of the titles in this six-title bill say in there, for a gun that has passed through or affected interstate commerce. Now, a couple of the titles don't include that provision, so we would presume that those titles are unconstitutional. The, the bill itself sort of admits that by trying to fix the constitutional problem in four of the titles. But that's what you get when you throw a bunch of, you know, six bills together like this. Some of them aren't very well thought out, and um, they have constitutional issues that are even admitted to within the bill by putting in that interstate commerce clause. Well, Mr. Massey, let me ask you, what distinction, if any, does this legislation make uh, between the rights of law-abiding citizens, people that want to protect their homes and loved ones, uh, uh, and those that obviously want to make, you know, commit harm or do bad things? Is there any distinction? It doesn't distinguish. In, in fact, uh, because the people who are intent on committing crime are not going to obey the laws, it actually, to the, to the chairman's question or point before, uh, you know, I had a staffer who worked for me. Her name was Nikki Goser. And before she came and worked for me, she watched her husband be murdered by her stalker in front of her in a gun-free zone because she left her firearm in the car. She was licensed to carry a firearm. They went into a restaurant where at the time, in the state of Tennessee, if they served alcohol, you could, it was a gun-free zone. So she obeyed the law. Her stalker did not. She left the gun in the car, and now she has to live with the rest of her life wondering if she could have saved her husband, Ben. And that's the problem with these laws. Well, one last question. It's abundantly clear that uh, neither of these amendment bills or neither of these bills will, will get much serious consideration in the Senate. You actually made that, uh, that point in uh, your opening remarks. Uh, in the Senate, there are bipartisan uh, efforts underway to, to see uh, if there's some common ground here and, and we can move ahead. Uh, but uh, the rhetoric on the other side in the House, uh, with all due respect, is uh, basically this is sort of take it or leave it. Uh, which one do you, which approach do you think is, is likely to actually uh, end up with a package that might bat, pass both chambers and be signed by the president? Well, it has to, to your point, it has to pass both chambers, be signed by the president, and be upheld by the Supreme Court. And what we heard in our committee is one of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle said that if this doesn't pass the Senate, they will get rid of the filibuster and that they will pack the court. Those were his words. Uh, so do they have, a, a, do, does any of this, so to answer your question, I would say this, this legislation doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell as long as they follow the, the, you know, the Constitution and the institutions that we have set up. But if they're willing to tear down everything that's been constructed in, in this country and balanced government in order to achieve it, they could get it passed if they resort to the methods and means that were alluded to in our hearing on this bill. Thank you very much. Yield back. Yeah, John, let me let me just say that um, I, you know I, I do believe these bills will pass the House, um, and maybe on some of these provisions there'll be bipartisan support. I I, I would be curious to uh, see how people go home and explain uh, why they thought it was inappropriate to uh, raise the age when a young person can purchase an AR-15 from 18 to 21. But anyway, maybe maybe. 
maybe people feel comfortable with that, uh, and I think it would pass the Senate um, uh, if it weren't for the filibuster. And by the way, there are lots of exceptions to the filibuster, uh, some that the Republicans put into place. Uh, and, uh, and I think the President would sign this into law. And, um, you know, and with this Supreme Court, who the hell knows? But um, because precedent doesn't really mean anything to them. But in any event, uh, Mrs. Torres. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, it's, uh, it's really disappointing um, that once again we are here um, to take up common sense gun violence legislation. Common sense. In response, by the way, to multiple mass shootings across our entire country, all of us saw the horror that unfolded in Uvalde, Texas. 21 people were murdered by an 18-year-old. 19 of them were children, two teachers, brutally taken from us while learning their ABCs. It is deeply disturbing to recognize that this event was the second deadliest K through 12 school shooting on record and the second mass shooting in just a 10 day span after the shooting at the supermarket in Buffalo, uh, New York, which killed 10 people. I think I might stand corrected on this because there were another 13 mass shootings over the weekend. This weekend, 13. More than 12 people are going to be buried because of the inaction of Republicans. Over 70 people were injured because of the inaction of Republicans. Communities across our country are hurting. No one, no one in the business of cleaning classrooms should have to clean brain matter, blood, body parts from the walls, from the ceilings, wipe the floors. No child should be murdered to the extent that they are unrecognizable. that it would have to take a DNA test for parents after waiting hours and hours and hours to hear if their child was injured, hopefully still alive, but to learn that they would not see their child ever again because their entire body was destroyed by a gun, allowed to be on our streets by this Republican minority. You dare to say that is the mental health status, that is a, uh, we want to blame that, you know, people are not mentally stable. But let me remind you of the many times that you have voted against bills that have tried to bring mental health to our communities. Let's just talk about the omnibus, which would, have which would increase funding for needed gun violence prevention. And it included $47,184,000 increase for ATF an additional $44,961,000 for the NICS system. You know what the NICS system is? That's the background check. Because three days isn't enough, and we need to fix that system. But you voted against that. You voted against funding to just fix the system, $95 million. For community violence prevention programs, you voted against that. You voted against studying this pandemic that we have.
let me tell you and remind the people what you do support and what you are willing to do. You can't say gay in Florida. I mean, Mickey Mouse is being punished because you can't say gay in Florida. But you would allow a gun manufacturer to build and target, to target children by building an AR-15 for their little hands. What do you expect a second grader who is calling 911 multiple times asking for help to pull out their junior AR-15 out of their backpacks and shoot back? unrealistic. You have allowed a gun manufacturer to build a gun, an AR-15 named the Crusader. Crusader. It is stamped with a Bible verse, Psalm 144, 1. And the demand is so high for this weapon that currently there is a 12 to 18 month waiting list for it. If you don't know what, the, what that Bible verse says, let me read it to you. It says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. That's what that Crusader AR-15 is stamped with. Is that religious terrorism, by the way? I don't know. But I know that I've seen a lot of hurt in our communities. Resorting to calling out Uvalde officers, police officers, as cowards because they did not run in when they should have, when we feel, believe that they should have, I think is cowardly. To call them cowards and not do anything to help protect them or their children that we believe they failed to protect. You know why I believe that? Because police officers know very well that their weapons, that their armor did not stand a chance, that their body would not stand a chance against an AR-15. They knew. They knew that if they were shot, that they would not be recuperating. They knew that they, if they were shot, that their wives and their children and their mothers would not recognize them. They understood that their blood, that their brain matter, that their body parts will be splattered all over those classrooms as well. They knew that. So you can't call them cowards. You should call yourselves cowards for failing, for failing our children. No one should have to go through that pain of waiting for a DNA test to know if your child is alive, is in a hospital bed, or part of cells. You can't hide behind mental health issues. You can't hide any longer. People know who you are. People know that you're failing them. 
When it comes to gun sales, people know your priorities. Your priorities are the Benjamins, as one of my colleagues has said in the past. Your priorities, when it comes to guns, is how much political money you can put into your campaign accounts. Because if that wasn't the case, all of you would be supporting my bill. A little maneuver that you did under the Trump administration. Because murdering children and people, murdering children while they're learning their ABCs, and murdering people while they are in church, or murdering people while they are at a concert, or murdering people while they are at a Walmart isn't enough for you here in the US. So you see, they changed the law in gun exports. The State Department, who was in charge of gun sales, gun exports, We kept pushing them because our neighbors to the south and to the north continue to be concerned about the number of weapons that are being sold in their countries. But yet, instead of listening to them, you decided to make it easier for your donors to make more money so they can give you more money. So you change the jurisdiction from the State Department and gave it to the Department of Commerce. The Department of Commerce, who is in charge of selling US-made goods. Shameful. Shameful. As the chairman earlier stated, you would do anything to protect the ducks in your state, but you have done zero to protect the children in our country. Or the God abiding people in church. Or country loving people who just want to go to a concert and go shopping. Enough is enough. You can stand on the side of children and the victims of your demise, or you can continue to stand on the side of your donors. It's time to take action. It is time to pass these bills. I urge all of my colleagues to support these bills, and I yield back. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. I just want to correct the record on a few things. Uh, first, there's been a lot of talk about polling and that 90% of Americans support universal background checks. Uh, but the facts just don't support that. There was a great New York Times article that ran over the weekend uh, that talked about the difference between polling and actual vote performance on several referendums. I'm just going to quote <coughs> uh, some of the states. So in California, there was a uh, referendum in 2016. It was expected that you would get 91 support to curtail Second Amendment rights. The referendum passed only by 63%. In Washington State in 2014, expected support was 81%. The actual support was only 59%. Nevada in 2016, expected support 86%. Actual support 50%. Maine also in 2016, expected support 83%, actual support 48%. So when it comes to the polling, um, I'm very skeptical because the polling data on this issue doesn't match the actual performance of these public referendums. And th these are very liberal states, California, Washington State, Nevada, and Maine. Also, I'd like to remind my colleagues that it was the Republicans, it was Republican Congress and Republican President who in 2017 actually shepherded in the Fix Nix Act uh, that's, that's now law. Additionally, just for the record, any commercial firearm purchase requires a background check. That's the current state of the law. So with that, with that being said, 
Uh, Chairman Nando, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you know what the AR and AR-15 stands for? It stands for slow rifle. So that's not, um, Mr. Massey, do you know what it stands for? Armalite is original manufacturer. Yeah, exactly. It's unfortunate because Armalite was the first manufacturer of the platform. I think it was 1963, and it's different than an M16 platform. I know I was in the Navy, shot M6, actually M4s. But it's still an assault rifle. I would, I would, I would disagree with that uh, characterization. I'll explain why. It's because with uh, an M4 and M16, there's a function for fully automatic fire, also three-round burst. On an AR-15, there's no such function because it's a, it's a firearm for public sales, not military sales. So I would say to call it an assault rifle is actually a mischaracterization of the platform. It just, it just conflates two different uh, guns that look similar, but have very different functions. Also, Mr. Nadler, do you, I recall that when I was on your committee, you wanted to have the right to vote extended to 16 year olds. Is that, is my memory correct? No, your memory's not correct. I never said that. You never said you didn't support House Bill One, which wanted to take the voting age to 16. Are you sure? I don't recall ever supporting that bill. Would you? There would are you, people back in New York who support the concept. I I do not. All right, your memory might be better than mine, but I'm pretty sure when I was on your committee, you were pushing a bill that included the right for 16-year-olds to vote. Uh, but you might be correct. I might be correct. I'll have to go back and, and check. I, I think you're not correct. Okay. Well, that's. And that could be correct. I just know there's people in your party and the people that testified on that committee that wanted to extend the right to vote to 16-year-olds, but uh, neither here nor there. You were talking about Illinois, Chairman Nadler, um, and about the gun laws in Illinois. Are you aware that in 2021, just in Chicago, which is a Democrat-controlled city, there were 3,561 shootings? That was actually 300 yes, more. My, yes, my point was, yes, my point was, that in New York, as well as in Chicago, both of which have fairly strict gun, gun control laws, the laws are ineffective, and you have a lot of uh, uh, mayhem committed uh, with guns because you have lenient laws in other states, and people uh, illegally bring in guns, which they purchase legally in other states with weak laws, and they bring them into New York or Illinois. And that's why it's, call, it's called, in fact, the iron pipeline, the pipeline of of, of guns coming in from uh, states, usually in the South or wherever, that uh, have weak laws into states like New York and uh, Illinois that, has that have strong laws. And that, uh, with, with those guns, there's, there's, there's mayhem. Yeah, in that, Mr. Chairman, that argument would be compelling if it weren't for the fact that it's already illegal to take those guns into Illinois. It's already a crime to move across the state line into Illinois. Of course, with but, those but, guns. but as... as of course, but as I think the ranking member observed, that I think Mr. Massey observed correctly, criminals don't obey laws um, by definition. And yes, it is illegal uh, to, to bring a, uh, uh, these guns into New York or Illinois, but criminals legally purchase them in other states and illegally bring them in to New York or Illinois, which have strong laws, and there they cause carnage. Yeah, and Mr. Chairman, it's just not it's just not the ranking member and the chairman of this committee who believe uh, who have uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to impugn you, uh, Mr. Cole. It's just not the chairman of uh, this committee who has that those views. It's actually the president, because when he was a senator and I quote Joe Biden, I am convinced that a criminal who wants a firearm can get one through illegal, untraceable, unregistered sources with or without gun control. And again, that was President Biden, in his own words. And again, you just admit it, it's already illegal to bring these guns in. Yet, despite these cities that have the strictest gun control measures, you have the highest rates of crime. Uh, Mr. Massey, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I would just like to speak to uh, Chairman Nadler's point. You aren't legally purchasing a firearm if you purchase it in one state with the intent to take it to another state and sell it to somebody and you're not a licensed dealer. So that's actually not legal now. And to Chairman McGovern's point about the high-capacity magazine ban um, would have stopped uh, the shooter at Virginia Tech. The reality is that the Virginia Tech shooter used a handgun, had 17 magazines, almost all of them were 10-round magazines, would not be banned 
um, in this law. And also at Columbine, one of the shooters there used a high point carbine rifle and carried 13 10 round magazines. So the, I just wanted to make that point clear that the legislation says, I mean, you're, you're misleading people. It, 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 you're gonna do something about uh, school shootings if you ignore the fact that most of these shootings happen with a handgun, it's the ones with the Armalite 15 that are publicized, and um, the shooters carry 10-round magazines if, they, if it's more convenient than a 20-round magazine, which are actually the 10-rounders are more reliable in many cases than a higher capacity one. Yeah, and Mr. Massey, you brought up uh, Columbine. I was in high school when that took place, and again, if memory serves me correct, there was already an assault weapons ban during Columbine that did nothing to stop that school shooting, is that That's correct, and, and also the shooters there, when they acquired the firearms, were 17, and they used a straw purchaser, a, a, a woman, a girl, I guess, who was older than them, but, um, you know, and then when they later committed the crime, at least one of them was 18, but they acquired the firearms through a straw purchaser, you, which was already illegal anyway. It's it's a we FF. Pass, no, it's. We had to pass an initiative to make it illegal. It on the 4473 is a federal crime I'll, that the girl committed to buy that firearm. Mr. Perlman, I'll, I'll, it's okay. If, if I'll you defer you to you on state law. I assume you are absolutely correct about the state law. I'll, I'll yield to you if you want. I'm not. Okay. Um, okay. Let's just talk about straw purchases in the current state of the law. When you purchase a firearm on the ATF form, anybody that's purchased a firearm knows this, you've got to check off, and you mentioned this in your statement, you've got to check off if you're buying this for yourself. In fact, the exact language states, and I quote, warning, you are not the actual transferee slash buyer if you are acquiring the firearms, firearm or firearms on behalf of another person. If you are not the actual transferee slash buyer, the licensee cannot transfer the firearm or firearms to you, end quote. So there you have, you, straw purchases are illegal. Are you aware of the penalty on that? I think it's about five years, but it's rarely prosecuted. Right. Mr. And, Nadler, and, do you- And if, if I could say one quick thing that was, uh, it was mentioned here earlier today that 13 mass shootings happened this weekend. Why weren't all those on the news? Because most of those were probably gang-related shootings committed with a handgun by people who've never purchased a gun legally. Mr. Nadler, I know this bill, uh, Chairman Nadler, I know this bill takes the sentence for straw purchases from five years to 10 years. Do you think that five-year increase is going to make a difference? I, I'm genuinely asking. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think so. Uh, I think that uh, uh, a 10-year uh, sentence is a very substantial sentence for people, and some people th will think twice. Yeah, just curious on that. Um, are you aware that there was a congressionally mandated study on federal, uh, and I'm going to quote, assault weapons ban that ran from 94 to 2004, and that, found, that study found that that ban had no impact on crime. Are you aware of that? No. I, I, uh, my recollection is that uh, many reports said that that ban had very substantial uh, uh, effects and, and good ones, and it was, a, it, was, it was a terrible day when it was allowed to expire. Could I, could I interject quickly? Uh, sure, Mr. Mass. Um, the, the sales of Armalite-style AR-15 firearms went up from 94 to 2004. Probably the number owned um, in the United States more than doubled because the ban was a cosmetic ban on bayonet lugs um, and flash hiders. And so the manufacturers within a couple years were making the same style rifle without bayonet lugs and flash hiders and so and it was a very popular rifle and sales went through the roof during the so-called assault weapons ban so if it had an effect if these if it wasn't on because it decreased the number of so-called assault weapon rifles out there they went up right uh and mr nadler my um Staff handed me a portion of the study that I was referencing, and I will get your staff a copy of it. But the congressionally mandated study that I referred to found that the assault weapon ban from 94 to 2004 found that the ban had no impact on crime, in part, and I quote, because the banned guns were never used in more than a modest fraction of gun murders, end quote. 
There's also a study from Urban Institute that says rifles of any type are used in only 2% of murders. Rifles are only used in 2% of murders. There's an FBI study. Uh, subsequent research conducted by the RAND Corporation found no conclusive evidence that banning assault weapons or large capacity magazines has an effect on mass shootings or violent crime. So again, the facts are as they are. Additionally, <clears throat> there was another study that revealed that murder rates were 19.3% higher when the federal assault weapon ban was in effect. I think Mr. Massey were referring to that. Uh, additionally, the San Bernardino and the Newton mass shootings took place despite the existence of assault weapon bans in California and Connecticut, respectively. Additionally, in 2019, the FBI reported there were four times as many individuals listed as killed with knives or cutting instruments than with rifles of any kind, and that rifles were listed as being used in less homicides than blunt objects or personal weapons, like hands and fists. So, Representative Massey, I know you were talking about um, James versus Bonta, which is the Ninth Circuit case from 2022 that, uh, that dealt with California banning 18 to 20 year olds. Would you like to expand upon that? Well, in, in um, Heller, the problem is, and I know my colleague, Mr. Raskin, is going to jump to Heller and, and extol the virtues of uh, one of the majority decisions, I think, here after a while. He's, uh, but what they said is you can't completely extinguish a person's right. Not, not that it couldn't be regulated, um, just anticipating Mr. Raskin's comments, but what you will virtually do, and I think they're going to say, that, you know, when the Supreme Court rules on this, just like the Ninth Circuit has ruled here recently on the ban on long guns for 18, 19, and 20 year olds in California, I think they're going to say that you went too far, that you've, not for everybody, but for a category of people who are protected under the Constitution, you've virtually extinguished their right to legally acquire a firearm. Uh, Mr. Massey, I'd like to just talk about the so-called large capacity um, that my colleagues on the Krusty Owl keep talking about. I would describe this as actually regular capacity because most, uh, you could expand upon that, what most handguns actually take in terms of capacity. But uh, to your knowledge, do these magazine uh, limits actually impact uh, crime or does this or just uh, take away the rights of law-abiding citizens? Well, um, the, the chairman earlier said that in Kentucky you can't engage game birds with migratory game birds with more than three rounds. Well, that's to give them a, a sporting chance. We don't intend to give uh, would-be rapists and, and thieves and murderers who break into our house a sporting chance in Kentucky. So that doesn't similarly exist. But, t you know, with handguns, uh, now, the, as you said, the standard capacity is, is more than 10, unless it's a very small handgun. But a standard size uh, Glock, for instance, most of those come with uh, magazine capacities that are higher than 10. Which, and so you're, you're virtually banning the gun itself if you ban the magazine that it accepts. And so when they say they don't want to take away your guns, yeah, they want to take away every one of those handguns that can accept a, a double stack magazine or something that holds more than 10. You were talking about the firearm storage requirements and how that may impact a gun owner's right. Could you expand upon that, please? This, this is probably the most terrifying provision of the bill. Um, you know, the, one of the bad parts is it, uh, of it is that criminals, they know that anybody who's going to follow this law is going to have their guns uh, locked up and hard to access access in the event of a break-in. But what's more disturbing, I think, is the vague, loose wording of what is stored securely. It says uh, what a reasonable person would consider secure. It's literally the term that is used in here, a reasonable person. And so if I don't know who that reasonable person is going to be, but it could be uh, an anti-gun director of the ATF who now becomes th the person who gets to adjudicate reasonable. And if a, if a reasonable person, maybe the director of the ATF who doesn't like guns, says that it's not stored safely, that's grounds for confiscation at that point. Again, they say they don't want to take your guns. Why would they have the provision to confiscate your gun if there's some disagreement about what reasonable and secure is? I'd like to turn now to talk about the so-called rapid due process. Um, it's in the bill, too. Uh, as my colleagues on this committee know, 
uh, I used to be a district judge in Pennsylvania. I actually had to have ex parte hearings where you only have one, by definition, you only have one side. I can tell you it's incredibly difficult uh, to ascertain a decision when you're only hearing from one side, incredibly diff difficult. In the vast majority of the time, the petitioner wins, which isn't surprising because the other side isn't there. Would you like to talk about the, the aspect of ex parte hearings relative to this bill? I think it goes against uh, several hundred years of jurisprudence here that you wouldn't get to know who your accuser was um, and that you couldn't, you're not guaranteed a lawyer in, in a lot of those situations, especially the, the various state laws. So um, I think it's troublesome just that it, it, it turns all of that on its head. And um, to get your rights back, if you, if you look at Floridas that have, or at states, like maybe Florida, that have instituted this, a, lo a lot of them on, upon further review are overturned and a lot are not. And it takes about $10,000 of resources. You would know better than I that, you know, what it costs to hire a lawyer. Thanks, Mr. Massey. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The reasonable person standard is used quite commonly throughout law, and I'll, I'll let uh, Mr. Raskin, as a legal scholar, uh, address that. So that's not a like a. Let's, well, well, I. Uh, yeah, well, well, you're 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 a, you're a, you're, a, you're a legal scholar too. I'm sorry. I, I, can we can I, we I, use uh, the term reasonable capacity on magazines? Uh, uh, number one. Number, one. Num uh, number two. Um, I want to ask unanimous consent to insert on the record since the New York Times has brought up the New York Times story that just recently appeared. Mass shootings where stricter gun laws might have made a difference. And then, um, I, you know, maybe maybe it's just the way I heard it, uh, but it sounded like we were somehow trying to downplay what an AR-15 is. And you know, um, the AR-15 can fire 45 rounds per minute. Modified with a bump stock, it can fire 400 rounds per minute or more. Um, it, um, uh, the, the bullet from an AR-15 leaves the muzzle at 3,300 feet per second. That's three times the speed of a modern handgun bullet, which means um, it has plenty of energy to do damage inside a body. In fact, the bullet is specifically designed not to pass straight through a body, but to tumble around destroying flesh and organs as it works its way through at a, at a at brutal speed. Um, in terms of damage, think hollow point. Um, I mean, I mean, you know, nobody here is talking about trying to take away everybody's guns or take away people's ability to hunt or, or self-defense. And with respect to my colleague from Pennsylvania, maybe some you know, maybe the polls um, that he was referring to, maybe they tightened up because of the misinformation that the gun lobby puts out there every time there is a reasonable attempt to try to um, address gun violence by saying everybody wants to take away all your guns. They want to re repeal the Second Amendment. Um, we hear that all the time. And so people do nothing. And um, But think about the damage an AR-15 can do. And maybe think about those children. Um, and I know some people think it's a laughing matter, and that's fine, but I think it's tragic and it's sad. And it's sick that people somehow think it's not a big deal. But I do, and I'll tell you, those parents do. And the parents I met at Sandy Hook do. And the parents that I've talked to from countless mass shootings do. Yeah, but this is not just some nothing gun. Um, and again, as has been said over and over and over again, the, the children um, who were killed um, in Uvalde, uh, many of them had to be identified by the DNA from their parents. And think about that for a minute. Um, anyway, Mr. Uh, Perlmutter. Um, this subject gets me very upset. I managed, not managed, but I had the unfortunate duty of being a state senator for the area where Columbine was, and then as a member of Congress 
uh, the area where um, the Aurora movie theater shooting occurred. So I've uh, had to deal with um, a lot of families that are just completely despondent and in despair communities that have been scarred forever as a result of uh, mass shootings. And I guess, Mr. Massey, you know, you and I get along on a lot of things. We don't agree a lot on a lot of things, but we get along on, on this subject and the reason for my outburst, and I apologize to the gentleman from Pennsylvania and to you, sir, Mr. Massey, on the uh, straw purchase in Colorado, we passed the initiative to ban straw purchases after Columbine did occur. Now, maybe somewhere in the books there was some law about it, but we actually took the initiative to, to do that because uh, these young men who, for one reason or another, were completely angry and unstable, took it out on their classmates. And in Aurora, uh, that young man, he was in his 20s, uh, again, very unstable. Uh, he did have magazines that were 100 uh, bullet magazines, if you will. They got jammed, thank goodness, um, or the carnage would have been much worse. It was bad as it was. And the, 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 the damage that happens, not just to the child who's shot or the moviegoer who's shot or the shopper who's shot, but to their families, to the communities, to the other employees, to the other people in the theaters, to the priests and the preachers and the doctors. It's just, you can't, it's just uh, terrible. So I guess what is bothering me, Mr. Chairman, and the question I would ask sort of rhetorically, and, but in general, is to ask that the purchase of an assault rifle, the age be raised to 21, to require background checks on those who were to purchase firearms, and to have a red flag type of warning system that alerts people, the judiciary, law enforcement, psychologists, to someone who may go on a rampage, how those three things can be unacceptable um, to the Republican Party here in the Congress of the United States is beyond me, especially, and I do appreciate, Mr. Massey, um, the way you raised certain points regarding the Second Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment. I, I would argue every single point with you, but I don't want to get into that. I would just ask you, when our founders said in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life. That's what begins, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And these children in Uvalde, the young, the, the kids, the teenagers at Columbine, the shoppers in Buffalo, the we could go on forever, the concert goers in Las Vegas, the church goers in South Carolina, the, the, the you know, there's so many others, whether it's churches or shopping centers or movie theaters or concerts or schools. I, I, this has got to stop. And really, since Columbine, it's gotten worse. And the laws haven't gotten better. They've been opposed each and every time certainly here in the Congress. You know, and then the Constitution begins to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare. Those are the underlying principles of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And when we don't take this up, but just oppose it by saying, well, we read the Second Amendment to say X, Therefore, these underlying pillars of our Constitution and the Declaration of Independence don't matter. Don't, we don't care. They come first. And, I, you know, you were sort of 
not you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Massey, as he was uh, testifying, was going through a variety of um, arguments that ultimately might rise to the Supreme Court. Well, I'm going to make those same arguments that that court needs to look at the deeper pillars, the foundational principles of our Constitution, of the Declaration of Independence, when looking at this. And these lives continue to be lost. Families are harmed. Communities are scarred. And the, these are such practical, simple, reasonable efforts to curb this violence. I don't see how anybody could question it. The last thing I will say, and this is to my friend, uh, Mr. Reschenthaler, as well as to Mr. Massey. When you say that individuals are being deprived of due process, they are not. They are not being deprived of due process. There is, in these bills and in the state bills, the opportunity to be heard and recognized and, and provide defense for themselves. Every state in the country and, and the federal government, if somebody is a threat to themselves or to others, can be committed for up to, in Colorado, 72 hours, but then has a, an opportunity to appear and defend themselves, an opportunity to be heard. That same principle applies here. But you don't want to have, in the moment, a whole bunch of kids getting shot. And the Constitution will uh, provide that those lives are protected for a period of time before somebody does that, but they'll have an opportunity to be heard in court, and they are. So I don't agree with the, the, the argument that Mr. Massey raised. I don't think it uh, really holds water with respect to the Constitution or the underlying principles of our nation. And um, if the gentleman wants to respond, otherwise I'll yield back to the chair. No, I just thank you for making the clarification with the state law on uh, straw purchases. Probably, maybe not a bad idea to pass a state law to do that if the, if the federal law is not being enforced. Um, probably give the state prosecutors and, and we call them Commonwealth attorneys in Kentucky, but you're not a Commonwealth, you're state, but um, we give them more opportunities to prosecute these things that aren't prosecuted. And I would um, yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fishbach. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, just first of all, I just wanted to comment in your opening statement, you talked about uh, how you get stopped in your district. Yes, Mr. Chair. I referred to Mr. Chair. <laughs> but in your um, opening statement, you said you get stopped in your district, and people ask you, what the hell or are you doing? And, and you know what? You're not the only one that gets stopped in your district. I get stopped in my district, and uh, people ask what the hell is going on in D.C., and uh, they do not support they bill, these bills. They, they express their opposition to these bills. And I, and I thought it only fair that, you know, that uh, I mentioned that because I want to make sure that people understand that, uh, that we are representing them here. And that is why when we are hearing from our constituents, that is why we are talking about so, these. We're representing. We, so when the general lady gets stopped, people actually say to you, I want, I want my 18-year-old son or 18-year-old daughter to be able to buy an AR-15 as soon as they turn 18? Is that what they tell you? Mr. Chair? They say they oppose these bills the way they are written. They oppose these bills. And I heard that repeatedly over the last few days, whatever it's been since we heard it in judiciary, and uh, that these bills are go, go far beyond, and these are gun owners who oppose these bills. Rate and I wanted to make sure. 21 uh, is something yeah. that you're And I think for a lot of the same reasons that Mr. Massey has been explaining, that these people share that opinion. And I just thought it was only fair that, yeah, that right. I mentioned that, that, that we do hear from our constituents, too, yeah, well. and that our constituents oppose these bills. Would the general lady yield? So the bill doesn't ban just assault rifles or so-called assault rifles for 18, 19, and 20-year-olds. And it's the, any centerfire, semi-automatic right. rifle or shotgun with a detachable magazine. And that, that does include hunting rifles. And during our debate in the committee, uh, Judiciary Committee, I offered to the chairman to co-sponsor a bill to raise the draft age to 21. I mean, we need to pick well, I'd, I'd, I'd a, a, that. 
I, I would think Chairman McGovern would support me in that, but the Chairman Nadler did not. And um, I think there just needs to be some agreement here. If you can, if you're ready to, you know, if you can the, the, be the, conscripted, the, the, the then maybe you should enjoy those the, rights. The, I yield back but, to. But, but the difference is that if you get conscripted and you are told to go into the military, you are trained and you are uh, you are evaluated with a gun. And, and the other thing is, I'm also curious whether Mr. or not, you Mr. Know, Chairman, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, constituents, you know, uh, think a ban on large capacity magazines which might reduce the number of mass shootings, um, whether they think that that's a bad idea too. I, I mean, I, I, I get it. But I mean, I, I think this debate, and I just say this respectfully, this is not a debate about whether or not people want to take away the right of people to legally own guns who are, um, or take away everybody's gun. This is not, this is not pro-gun versus anti-gun. This is about saving the lives of children Can and about upholding gun safety. Uh, the, Mr. Chair, I would yield to Mr. Maskey. I think he's got a comment on that. Yeah, so, you know, most people in Kentucky don't own an AR-15, mm -hmm. but they see where this is going. Um, a lot of people don't own 30-round magazines in Kentucky, but they own 15-round magazines, or they own 12 rounds. And they understand that banning 30-round magazines is not going to solve the problem. So what will we be doing in Congress when we find out that, gee, raising it to 21 didn't work because most mass public shootings are committed by people that are older than that. Uh, raising, they're limiting magazines to 10 or 15 rounds didn't work because they just carried more magazines with them. And so it's the people who you might even agree are reasonable people <laughs> that are worried um, because they see the direction this is going. If any of these things would work, they might agree with you, but they know enough about firearms, for instance, they know, you, you accurately quoted the statistics on the 223 round, which is fired by an AR-15, but it's a 55 grain bullet. A nine millimeter handgun has a 100 grain bullet. It weighs twice as much, the projectile. A 45 caliber handgun contains a 230 grain bullet. That's four times as heavy, the projectile, and four times as large out of a 45 millimeter handgun and it's the people who own those pistols that are worried because they know the ballistics, the terminal ballistics of the handgun or shotgun, which fires buckshot. Nine rounds come out of that thing at once, each of them practically the size of a nine millimeter round. They know that if you're going to do this technically, if you're going to keep all of the guns out of the bad guys that could be possibly ever be used, not just the ones that show up in TV on TV, they know you're coming after their guns too. You'll have to, to stop, if this is your proposal, I yield it. And thank you, Mr. Massey, that was, that was important. And, and you know, I know that uh, um, Mr. Reschenthaler asked about the storage issues, and, but I think as you start talking about some of those technicalities and some of the directions this is going, um, you know, this, the bill uh, creates a much broader definition uh, for frame or receiver. And um, isn't it true under that new definition that uh, the firearms that have only one serial number, it could be required that they would have two distinct or additional distinct ones? And maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. I guess if, if you were, if you did mention that before, I, I might have <clears throat> That is on the, on the menu of things that have uh, passed out of judiciary committee. I think that particular provision, I'm not sure if that one's passed the floor of the House yet or not, but if it hasn't, it's surely on its way to the Senate. And the cons actually, that was ATF ruling that um, where they wanted, again, this is where a bureaucracy, we give them an inch and they take a mile. And so now they define not just the receiver as a firearm, but all the parts that go with it. And so now if you need to buy parts, you go through all of the same procedures and hurdles to get a part as you would a gun if they can serialize all of the parts. And Mr. Massey, wouldn't that make um, a lot of the firearms, if they only had one serial number, one legal firearms right now, illegal? It, it would, um, if they were to not to grandfather the, the firearms that um, are already in existence. And it doesn't appear as though they're going to grandfather those, does it? But they are grandfathered under the bill. They are? All right, then. I will look for that provision. Um, but I just want to, um, you know, just, and, and Mr. Macy, I just wanted to give you the opportunity if there is anything else you'd like to add. 
I would like to add that they talk about this rapid due process. When are they going to do that at the border? Uh, they argue that they had to let a million illegal aliens into this country because there weren't the time and resources to adjudicate uh, each of those situations. Yet for legal citizens, for gun owners in this country, you, they've decided that a, you know, a 30 minute hearing without you there is enough to say that you can have your constitutional rights revoked. Yet they, they haven't figured out how to adjudicate things at the border when people are clearly here illegally. I would just um, yield back after making that point. Thank you, Mr. Massey. And I, I, and I will just kind of uh, finish up because I, a lot of the questions that I had were asked, but, you know, you, you say that, uh, you know, there's, I think Mr. Massey had a very good explanation of, you know, why people are concerned about this bill and that this was, you know, all of these kind of were thrown together, thrown into, thrown as a package. They were all, I know that they were all introduced. I saw you kind of squint or squish your face, but they were, they were sent through judiciary um, on a week that we were all gone. We had lots of things going on. And, um, and I just think that if, if you really want to get to the cause of these things, you need to be looking at the root causes and not just, uh, you know, putting together some bills that were already introduced and saying this is going to answer these questions and, or, or solve these problems, solve these, stop the, uh, you know, stop uh, shootings, whatever the case is. I think that we need to look at the root causes and really do some serious discussion about what's going on. This is something that w Republicans were not involved in. Republicans were not asked. This was put in front of us. And, and um, you know, I, I do think that it is important that people do understand that it is not just that Republicans oppose these. There are good law-abiding gun owners all over the country that oppose this legislation, oppose these pieces of legislation, and it's important that they have um, the opportunity for their voice to be heard too. So with that, I yield back. Well, thank you very much. I, I would just say, look, I mean, I think Mr. Nell is correcting the record on some of the things that uh, are in the bill and not in the bill, and I think we've all had enough time to read these bills. Um, and maybe people might be confused because uh, we some may be representing the bills incorrectly. Um, but I'd also just want to point out for the record too, you know, Mr. Massey kind of implied that uh, you know there are a lot of mass shootings by people who are over 21. But for the record, the shooting in Buffalo and the shooting in Uvalde were both by 18-year-olds. Um, and so again, I mean, I think a lot of those parents and those family members are wondering, you know, why it was so easy for an 18-year-old to go in and buy an AR-15 that was capable of doing such damage, um, and yet uh, that same person was not old enough to have a sip of beer, um, and um, you know, and they were able to do it with ease. Um, and in the case of the white supremacist in Buffalo, uh, to be able to get body armor as well. Um, and uh, I, I, so I, I think we need to make that clear for the record. Mr. Raskin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, welcome, Mr. Massey, and welcome, Mr. Nadler. You know, there are dozens of societies and civilizations in the history of our species that practiced human sacrifice including the sacrifice of children. Uh, the Carthaginians, the Mesopotamians, the Chimu civilization did it. There are dozens of civilizations that accepted or practiced or tolerated the sacrifice of children. Are we going to be a society that allows the sacrifice of children? Are we a society that will tolerate the practice of children being murdered? on a mass scale? Will we accept the sacrifice of children by mass murder as acceptable collateral damage for a fundamentally distorted and twisted interpretation of the Second Amendment? I hope not. Gun violence is now the leading cause of death among children in the United States. For the first time in our history, it's the number one cause of death of children under 18. 
Two-thirds of the thousands of kids killed by guns were homicide victims. As high-capacity magazines and assault weapons proliferate across our country, more and more children are dying without even the chance of being saved, not even a prayer of being saved. Emergency room doctors and pediatric trauma surgeons were waiting in Uvalde, Texas, for dozens of kids to arrive to try to save their lives. And they never arrived. Think about that. The doctors had nothing to do. The remains of 19 children at Robb Elementary School had to be identified, not visually, but by DNA samples taken from their mutilated, unrecognizable bodies and matched up with the DNA of their grieving parents. Is there any parent in this room who would tell the parents of the Uvalde children, the death of their kids was an acceptable sacrifice because of someone's deformed and distorted interpretation of the Second Amendment? And a young person here would do that? We've got one volunteer. Well, let's explore it because no matter what we advocate, universal, violent, criminal, background checks, bans on unusual and dangerous weapons, we are told not only that they violate the Second Amendment, but that we don't believe in the Second Amendment. I think it was said before that there were colleagues of ours on the Judiciary Committee who professed that they did not believe in the Second Amendment. I certainly didn't hear anyone, maybe one of, maybe Ms. Ross heard it, I, I certainly did it. Maybe Ms. Scanlon heard it. I never heard anybody say that. On the contrary, I heard people say they accepted the, the reasonable interpretation of the Second Amendment, which doesn't condemn us to child sacrifice in the United States of America. Let me start with an analogy, Mr. Massey, because I know you to be a nimble, clever lawyer. We've got a right to protest in America. We have a right to protest outside the White House. But the Supreme Court has also said that the right to protest and the right of free speech is uh, conditioned upon reasonable time, place, manner regulations. Cities and towns and states can adopt reasonable time, place, manner restrictions. So you've got a right to protest in Lafayette Square. You don't have a right to protest outside the White House with the loudest sound system in America at 2.30 in the morning and make it impossible for the president's family to sleep. That's been adopted by the Supreme Court in a number of cases, one dealing with the community for creative nonviolence, another Ward versus Rock Against Racism, I think that was in 1989, which said that uh, the, a rock concert in Central Park did not have a constitutional right to blare the music as loud as they could because there were other social functions taking place, including a nursery school and other things going on in Central Park. So uh, every right is subject to reasonable regulation and restriction around the borders. Now, let me just stop and ask you there, Mr. Massey. I mean, do you disagree with that reading of either First Amendment doctrine as it exists, or do you think that doctrine is wrong? Uh, according to your analogy, I think you are advocating f to um, arrest and uh, prosecute the protesters outside the Supreme Court justices. No, no I'm happy Was to talk about that later. Was that not the analogy you used? I, I'm trying to undertake You're a serious analysis You're asking me to respond. I well, well if, they, you, if, they, if they trespass, yes, you cannot trespass on other people's property. So, okay, now I've answered your question. Now you answer my question. Do you agree that First Amendment free speech rights are subject to reasonable time, place, manner restrictions? It's a very straightforward question. I mean, maybe let's make it easier. Do you accept that the Supreme Court has stated that repeatedly? Mr. Raskin, first of all, you, you started out by uh, making the analogy that some of us on the other side of the aisle were undertaking human sacrifice as if we were barbaric. I never said that. You said societies I said do, that people on the other side of the aisle were undertaking human sacrifice. I said other societies have done that. I'm asking what we What were you do. talking about? Because I'm trying to understand your analogies, and if that was an analogy that, that, that our society tolerates human sacrifice, 
Well, let and then me you're ask asking you, me to discuss in good faith with you. The First Amendment, I am. The, I do have a question would, on the floor. I would, I would love say your answer that, to it. I would say that if you um, applied the First Amendment differently to 18, 19, and 20-year-olds, you, you would run afoul of the Constitution. Okay, so because the Constitution doesn't treat age as a suspect classification with strict scrutiny, but it has to be reasonable. You agree with that? That's what the Supreme Court has said about age restrictions, right? I'm not an attorney, and I'm certainly not a professor right. of I, uh, I'm not trying to law. trick you, Mr. Messi. I'm just trying, I'm, I'm trying to get whether or not you accept the Supreme Court doctrine, which is that every fundamental right is cabined and conditioned by reasonable regulations and restrictions around it. And either you accept the Supreme Court has said that, or you don't. So um, you, you're probably aware of the 1995 Supreme Court ruling where they struck down the Gun-Free School Zone Act. Yes as an illegitimate exercise of Congress's power under the Commerce Clause. Right. Yeah. So, so the, the sort of boundary they put in there... didn't violate the First Amendment or the Second Amendment. It had nothing to do with that. They, they said that the uh, federal government didn't have the right to regulate that if the gun wasn't engaged in interstate commerce. Yes. So what is your point? I, My point is... All right. If you we're know what? We're not going to be able to proceed Socratically because... You're, you're defeating the basic principle of the Socratic I'm defeating method, which is your to answer argument the questions, and you're Supreme not doing Court that. Rulings. I'm sorry? I'm defeating your argument with Supreme Court rulings, and I, I, I haven't even studied this. I think you have not this. for one second, because with respect to the First Amendment, whether it's Ward versus Rock against racism or a dozen other cases about reasonable time, place, manner restrictions, the Supreme Court has said that the fundamental right of free speech can be cabined by the regulation of those rights in the interests of other social interests. And you know who else said that with respect to the Second Amendment? And here I'm going to really Please. urge you, even though you're not a lawyer, to read District of Columbia versus Heller about the Second Amendment. Now, the big argument before Heller was whether or not the Second Amendment right was necessarily tethered to service in a well-regulated militia, like the National Guard, which was the position of four justices who lost. And the other five said, you don't have to be serving uh, in the National Guard. It's a right that applies to all individuals. That was Justice Scalia's position. That was the so-called conservative position. But then Justice Scalia went on to enunciate a doctrine that was adopted by everybody on the court. And so I just want to read you some of these statements, and you tell me whether you agree with them or disagree with them, OK? so. Justice Scalia writes, I like most rights, the right secured by the Second Amendment is not unlimited. Agreed or disagreed? Well, it can save you some time, but you can go ahead and read those. I'm, I'm probably to the right of the five justices uh, who I, I think ruled you in the majority, are. and you're if, probably to the left of the four who ruled against it. Well, you're, you're so, definitely wrong about that. But uh, so, all right, you're going to save me the time and just say you don't agree with Justice Scalia's opinion here, is what you're saying. But okay, th this is illuminating for America, and I'll just reclaim the time. I don't think it's going to work for us to have a conversation, but le let me just state what Justice Scalia said was the rights secured by the Second Amendment are not unlimited. From Blackstone through the 19th century cases, commentators and courts routinely explained that the right was not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever, in any manner whatsoever, and for whatever purpose. And then he cites the authority for that. For example, the majority of the 19th century courts to consider the question held that prohibitions on carrying concealed weapons were lawful under the Second Amendment or state analogs. Although we do not undertake an exhaustive historical analysis today of the full scope of the Second Amendment, nothing in our opinion should be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill, or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms into sensitive places such as schools and government buildings, or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the com commercial sale of arms. Now, I understand you don't like that doctrine, and I appreciate your candor in saying you're way to the right of the five justices who decided this, but the five justices who defined a, first, a Second Amendment right for people to use a gun in self-defense, a handgun, or to access a rifle for hunting recreation, also said that these rights were subject to reasonable regulation. So I don't want to be told that I don't support the Second Amendment when I follow precisely what Justice Scalia said. And this legislation is a convergence of the common sense of the American people and the Constitution of the United States as interpreted by our Supreme Court. We have the authority as a people in our legislative institutions to regulate firearms to protect 
public safety, and to make sure we don't become a society that tolerates the sacrifice of children. That's the reality of the situation. So don't tell me that your opposition is because you support the Second Amendment. We all support the Second Amendment, and we are all working to make sure this legislation is consistent with the Second Amendment. And if it's not, then believe me, the Supreme Court that has been gerrymandered by your party will proceed to strike it down. So you don't have to worry about that. Just like you don't have to scare people by saying, oh, well, if you get rid of assault weapons or tanks or nuclear weapons, if you get rid of that, then they're going to come and take your handgun and they're going to take your hunting rifles and so on. It's ridiculous. And if a government tried to do it, the Supreme Court would stop it, and you know that. It's a serious business here. People dying all over the country every single day. There are massacres taking place. And they invite us to believe that Heller versus District of Columbia, which I just quoted from, is some kind of straitjacket on the authority of our people to promote the safety of our children in school, the safety of parishioners in churches, like the Mother Emanuel Church in South Carolina, or synagogues, like in Cleveland, Ohio. Walmarts, grocery stores like in Buffalo, somehow they want us to believe that the Second Amendment disables us from legislating in the interests of the security and the safety of our people. It's nonsense. It's propaganda. That's what it is. And the last point I want to make is this. We have people, and I don't know whether the, the good gentleman from Kentucky is amongst them or not, but we have people who are willing to cast out and overthrow more than 50 years of Supreme Court precedent protecting the right of privacy and medical decision making. They're willing to cast all of it aside in the interest of what they call a pro-life agenda, but they are not willing even to read the District of Columbia versus Heller decision and enact its philosophy of the Second Amendment in order to pursue a pro-life agenda for actually existing children. I yield back, Madam Chair. Ms. Callan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to start, my colleague from Pennsylvania entered some data regarding the limited number of homicides actually committed with rifles. And we heard this statistic cited last week during our Judiciary Committee hearing. And I looked it up because it sounded ridiculous, and it turns out it is. Um, it's based on FBI data for 2020, and it's true that there were 455 deaths, homicides attributed to rifles, and more than that, 662 attributed to people using their hands and feet. But there were 13,663 homicides committed by firearms, 77% of homicides are committed by firearms, so don't try to distract and, and divide and, and minimize what is happening by putting in these statistics. So I would ask unanimous consent to enter the May 20, I'm sorry, May 30th, 2022 article from the Austin American Statesman entitled Fact Check, Do More People Die from Hands, Fists, and Feet Than Rifles? Without objection. Thank you. Look, last Thursday we marked up the Protecting Our Children or Protecting Our Kids Act in Judiciary in the wake of mass shootings in Buffalo and Uvalde and Tulsa. And while we were in that hearing, there was another mass shooting at a funeral in Wisconsin. On Saturday night, there were more mass shootings, including two in Chattanooga and Philadelphia, and of course I represent part of Philadelphia, where six more people were killed and dozens more injured. I mean, if we look at the Philadelphia shooting alone, we see where we can do better with our gun safety laws. There was a ghost gun involved in that. Every single time I meet with state, local, or national law enforcement, they tell us we have to do something about the ghost guns. They are adding to this pipeline of crime guns headed to our streets, headed in between states, and the federal government can do something about it. So let's do something about it. I've heard again, um, that, you know, this claim that, oh, it's Democrat cities that have a problem with guns. That's not true. This isn't a Democratic problem. It's not a Republican problem. It's an American problem. 
that's again why we need federal legislation. Uvalde has a, a Republican mayor. So does Tulsa. Chattanooga is an independent. But this is an American problem. We need to face it as an American problem. I refuse to tell our kids that they have to be sacrificial lambs to a twisted theory of armed Second Amendment liberty that is decoupled from personal responsibility. It's also decoupled, as Mr. Mr. Perlmutter mentioned, from the overarching purpose of the Constitution to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. Arming everybody is not ensuring domestic tranquility, certainly. So we know we can do something. We are not helpless. We are not hopeless here. The bills we're considering are going to stem the flow of crime guns and ghost guns into our communities. They can reduce mass shooting casualties. They can keep guns from those that are a danger to themselves and others using due process appropriate to the situation, and they can prevent unauthorized firearm access to the millions of children currently living in homes with unsecured guns. Our children know we can do something. We all know it. We have the power to pass these constitution bills, constitutional bills, and give our kids a more hopeful and bright future, one that actually gives them a chance at domestic tranquility, the general welfare, and actually securing the blessings of liberty. So despite the escalating gun violence that we've seen in our country, and we now know that it's the leading cause of death for children in our country, we aren't hearing solutions from across the aisle. Despite the carnage, we're hearing that we need to slow down, study the problem for another couple decades, another 40,000 lost lives a year. So Chairman Nadler, do you have an opinion on whether the solution to gun violence today is to slow down? God, no. With all the mass shootings, it seems there's a mass shooting every day now, and it's accelerating. We're having more mass shootings this year than five years ago, certainly. We have to put a stop to this. As you said, as Congressman Rassin has said, we can't let our children be sacrificial lambs. We're not the Canaanites. We're not the Phoenicians. We know too much about what's going on. We have to act now. We should have acted a long time ago. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Morelli. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I uh, not only will brief, but I want to uh, thank each of uh, my colleagues who've spoken on the subject and always appreciate Mr. Raskin's uh, comments particularly related to uh, constitutional uh, decisions and court cases and had read a significant part of um, uh, the Heller decision and couldn't agree more with him. And the, the rights articulate, all rights uh, articulated in the Constitution are, um, are, are conditioned on uh, the need to balance other rights which... Um, which uh, uh, they impose upon. And, uh, and I guess I'm just feeling a profound sense of sadness. You know, my community was uh, one of the communities listed in the diary by the young uh, gentleman who uh, uh, tragically uh, killed uh, all those folks in, in Buffalo. And he particularly was focused on a, a part of my community that, that's a community of color. And um, had he been successful in Buffalo and getting away, uh, Rochester would have been the next place that uh, that he came. But it's just a profound sense of sadness at what goes on. I mean, the number of mass uh, murders just this weekend in the United States, I think it was six or seven. Um, the numbers are almost numbing to all of us. And so I guess the question, aside from all the technical issues, and I appreciate Chairman Nadler's uh, great leadership on this. Um, I think in the sense of of profound sadness. The question is, can Congress lead? Will we lead? Will we actually do what the American public wants us to do? I was at, as I'm sure many were, uh, I went to, I participated in four or five parades over the weekend and other events on Memorial Day and uh, was surprised at the number of people who approached me uh, during, after, um, ceremonies said, please, please, please go back to Washington, do something about the epidemic of gun violence in this country. Uh, and what was surprising to me is um, 
these people weren't necessarily Democrats or Republicans. They were independents. They were suburban, urban. They were black, white, brown. Um, I was at an, a veterans event over the weekend, and a, a veteran came to me and said, where are you on question of gun control? And I, I didn't know where he was. I said, well, we, we may disagree. I don't know, but this is how I feel, uh, that there's so much more that we have to do. And he said, geez, I don't think 21 is the age by which people should buy some of these weapons. I think it ought to be 25. Uh, and I think you people need to do something about this because America's crying out. 400 million guns in America, 20,000 murders by gun uh, in 2020, I think the last year for which we have data, not to mention 25,000 gun-related suicides in the United States. 45,000 people in the United States, 2020 alone died by gun-related violence. So uh, in that profound sadness and... Um, and my belief in this body that we will finally do something. I'm gonna pray that the work that we're doing here today and that we'll do this week and that the Senate will do will lead us to a place that's uh, better in America. Uh, and I'll just note this in closing, in 1990, um, I was elected for the first time in the New York State Legislature and uh, the primary issue in my campaign was how to ban semi-automatic assault weapons in the state of New York, something we continue to Fight on. I'm very proud of the state legislature over the last week uh, passed additional efforts to safeguard New Yorkers. Um, but it seems to me 30 years later, we have not made nearly as, uh, a any real progress in this country, for which I'm uh, also profoundly sad. But uh, Mr. perhaps now. Would you yield for a question, yes, Mr. Morelli? Yes, of course. But thank you for your eloquent remarks. And when you point out we're losing more than 40,000 people a year to gun violence, you know, that's. 20 times higher than most of the European countries. And that, that's a cause I know for great despondency, but I would think, and I want your thoughts on this, is it cause for hope too, because it shows that there are lots of things that we can actually do to bring the slaughter down. You know, it's a, it's a great point, and I appreciate uh, my colleague's uh, remark. When people talk about, first of all, people talk about how we have a mental illness, a problem with mental health issues in this country. That may be right, although certainly, certainly it is a huge disservice to people who have mental health issues to suggest that they will all result in violence or all result in what we saw in Texas and in Buffalo. But having said that, there's mental illness everywhere in Europe and other industrialized uh, countries. And yet, to your point, it, the number is, is so much larger in the United States by multiple factors, exponentially larger in the United States which does, on the one, on the one hand, um, should cause despair that we have not been able to deal with this, but to your, the, the, the more important point, uh, certainly a sense of hopefulness that if we do the right things here over the next several weeks, we can have a, a significant impact on uh, safeguarding the lives of generations of Americans to come. And uh, so I do take uh, a sense of hopefulness out of that, and uh, maybe now this is the time. The last 30 years, uh, many of us have been fighting on this issue, but maybe now, finally, 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 we've come to a point in America where we will follow the lead of the citizens of this country and do something meaningful. With that, I'll yield back, Ms. Madam Chair. Thank you. Ms. Ross? Mr. Desonia has uh, no comments. Okay. Um, thank you very much, you, Madam, Madam Chair. Chair. Um, as, as we've been discussing in recent weeks, um, this entire country has been shaken by senseless mass shootings that have taken the lives of innocent Americans going about their everyday activities, shopping for their families, attending schools, eating in restaurants, going to church or to synagogue. I visited two synagogues in my district um, last month, and they had to have police officers in front of the synagogues just so that worshipers could feel safe when they came in. And over the past few decades, gun violence in the United States has progressed into a full-blown public health crisis. According to data from the CDC, Americans today are more likely to be killed by firearms than by motor vehicle accidents. Now, I represent a southern state with plenty of law-abiding gun owners. But I've heard from hundreds of North Carolinians over the past few weeks calling for policy changes to reduce gun violence. 
Last week, Evan Billy, a coach for the Charlotte Junior Rifle Team in Charlotte, North Carolina, wrote an op-ed in our local newspaper expressing his support for raising the federal minimum age for purchasing a rifle to 21. Based on his experience training the junior rifle team and dealing with young people. He wrote, by offering access to rifles at an early age, our gun policy is aiding and abetting domestic terrorism. Raising the age to buy rifles is an effective and bipartisan first step. We can only debate common sense gun laws on common ground. And currently, our nation operates under a patchwork of state laws, allowing guns to be trafficked from states with lax gun laws to states with stricter regulations, as Mr. Chairman Nadler discussed. My home state of North Carolina ranks as one of the top seven states, which is the destination for over 50% of trafficked guns in the United States. That's not the kind of distinction we need in North Carolina. H.R. 2377 and H.R. 7910 are common sense gun safety bills that will keep our fellow Americans safe while respecting their Second Amendment rights. The Second Amendment, though fundamental to our Constitution, is not absolute, as we've discussed. And it should never be used as a tool to avoid taking action to reduce violence and save lives. Sensible gun safety measures keep our communities safe and reduce violent crimes and mass shootings, plain and simple. And the New York Times had a wonderful article on Sunday about how four of the provisions we're considering right now could have prevented several of the incidents of mass shootings over the past 20 years. It is also imperative that we keep guns out of the hands of individuals who have been deemed a threat to our society or a threat to themselves. And that's where the red flag laws come in. And North Carolina is considering this at the legislative level. But these are good, good initiatives for all of our people. With these bills, we will work to keep senseless violence from happening to our fellow Americans and allow them to live in peace rather than fear. I support the rule and the underlying bills, and I yield back. Mr. Nagus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll be brief. I, I certainly would share the sentiments and echo uh, the words from my colleagues, my colleague from North Carolina. I certainly couldn't speak any better than my colleague from Colorado, who recounted in great detail the myriad ways in which our state has been uh, impacted by gun violence, uh, including my community of Boulder, uh, which last year uh, was uh, the site of a tragic mass shooting at a grocery store where 10 members of our community uh, were killed. My community, my constituents have made clear to me that inaction is not an option, that it is time for this Congress to treat this issue with the seriousness that it deserves, and to treat it as the crisis that it is. Now, I think uh, my colleague uh, and constitutional law professor, uh, Representative Raskin, has done an able job of articulating the reasons why the legislation that we're considering today is congruent with the Constitution, including the Heller decision. I guess I want to pose a question to my colleagues. I, I serve with uh, Representative uh, Massey on the Judiciary Committee, and so I'm well aware of his position regarding this bill and its component pieces. I wonder, I uh, followed your comments, Mr. Reschenthaler, closely uh, in the RAND study that you quoted. Is there any piece of this bill that you support. I mean, you're going to have an opportunity tomorrow, of course, to make your voice known on every title of, of the bill. Are there components that you will support? Uh, no, because the negative provisions outweigh any positive provisions. But I think that what comes from the Senate, we can take a look at. But uh, right now, I just I don't see myself voting for this bill now. So I, I think it's illuminating, and I appreciate your candor, because much of the debate and the discussion today, as best as I can tell, has focused in on policies and proposals that aren't in this bill. The policies and proposals that are in this bill are common sense. They are straightforward. 
I'll just give one example. Bump stocks. We all remember well the massacre that happened in Las Vegas, where 58 people were brutally murdered. In response to that massacre, President Donald Trump banned bump stocks. This bill codifies that decision. But apparently that is too radical for my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Safe storage, not particularly controversial. The RAND study that uh, my colleague uh, from Pennsylvania quoted, he again used that study as best as I can tell to support his position that other measures that this Congress has considered but that are not the subject of this bill, uh, his view that they uh, were not effective in the past. That study also concluded, I'll quote here, that there is supportive evidence that safe storage laws reduce self-inflicted fatal and non-fatal injuries. That same study that my colleague quoted said, quote, moderate evidence exists that background checks reduce firearm homicides. Let's not cherry pick the data. Again, we can have a debate about the legal limitations of fundamental rights under our Constitution. And as I said, I think Representative Raskin uh, did a masterful job explaining why this legislation passes constitutional muster. We'll see what the courts have to say. But, you know, spare me arguments about the efficacy or lack thereof of the measures that we're considering when empirical evidence that I've seen suggests that every single one of the measures included in this bill will save lives. And that is reason enough for us to support this bill, which is precisely why I'll be supporting the bill and the rule. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Does any other member of the committee wish to ask a question? Seeing none. Mr. Burgess, are you on? I don't see Mr. Burgess on. So seeing there are no members. Okay, seeing that there are no other members that wish to ask a question, I would like to thank our witnesses for their testimony. Please leave with our stenographer or submit electronically anything that you would like inserted into the record. You're now excused. And are there any other members who wish to testify on H.R. 2377 and H.R. 7910? Seeing none, this closes the hearing on H.R. 2377 and H.R. 7910. Without any objection, the committee stands in recess without, uh, subject to the call of the chair.
Right. Rules Committee will come to order. At this time, the Chair will entertain a motion from the distinguished gentleman from California, Mrs. Torres. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 2377, the Federal Extreme Risk Protection Order Act of 2021, a closed rule. The rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the rule of the committee of the judiciary or their designees. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee Print 117-46 modified by the amendment printed in the Rules Committee report shall be considered as adopted and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. The rule provides one motion to recommit. The rule also provides for consideration of H.R. 7910 the Protecting Our Kids Act under a closed rule. The rule provides two hours of debate, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on the judiciary or their designees. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee Print 117-48 shall be considered as adopted and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. The rule provides that the chair shall put the, the question on re, retaining each title of the bill as amended in the order specified by the chair provides that the yeas and nays be considered as ordered on each of the questions and provides that the chair shall then put the question on engrossment and third reading of the text comprise those portions of the bill retained. The rule provides one motion to recommit. The rule directs the clerk in the engrossment of HR 7910 to make technical and conforming changes in the event of, in the event a portion of the bill is not retained. The rule provides that House Resolution 1151 and House Resolution 1152 are hereby adopted. Finally, the rule provides the House Resolution 188 is amended by striking June 10th, 2022, each place it appears, and inserting June 17th, 2022. Uh, you've heard the motion from the gentleman from California. Is there any amendment or discussion? I think. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Burgess here, I have an amendment. To the Dr. Rule. Bur Dr. Burgess. I, I have an amendment to the rule. I move the committee strike the language of the rule that uh, deems a budget resolution passed by the House. Uh, Chairman of Government, as you know, House Democrats have not marked up a budget resolution since they won the majority in January of 2019. Speaker Pelosi has often said, show me your budget and I will show you what you value. But don't get to see a budget. The majority has introduced a budget resolution that no one has had time to read or understand. The budget resolution that uh, has had no committee process, no amendments, and not even a separate vote on the House floor. This budget resolution that you clearly do not think will pass as a standalone measure, so we're deeming it passed in a rule today. So, setting our long Top line budget levels is far too important to simply be included last minute into without consideration for that reason. I reach adopt my motion. I'll yield back to the chair. Uh, thank you very much. You've heard the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion? Hearing none, the vote is on the Burgess Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Can no. you the chair? The noes have it. Mr. Chairman, I guess for the A's and A's. A's and A's have been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mrs. Torres? No. Mrs. Torres? No. Mr. Perlmutter? No. Mr. Perlmutter? No. Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin? No. Ms. Scanlon? Mr. Morelli? No. Mr. Morelli? No. Mr. Desaunier? No. Mr. Desaunier? No. Ms. Ross? No. Ms. Ross? No. Mr. Nagus? Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Burgess? Both sides. Mr. Burgess? Aye. Mr. Russianthaler? Mr. Russianthaler? Aye. Mrs. Fishbach? Aye. Ms. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman, no. How is Ms. Scanlon recorded? Ms. Scanlon is not recorded. Ms. 
McKibben, how do you want to vote on this? Allen votes. Okay. One more time. Oh, can't hear you. Try one more time. Scanlon votes no. Okay. Uh, all right. Clerk, clerk will report this vote. Four yeas, eight nays. Members not agree to it. Are there further amendments? If not, the vote is on the motion by the gentleman from California. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Opinion, no. Chair, the, opinion chair, the ayes have it. Yeas and nays have been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres, aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Yes. Mr. Perlmutter, aye. Mr. Raskin. Yes. Mr. Raskin, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Yes. Mr. Morelli. Aye. Mr. Morelli, aye. Mr. Desaunier. Aye. Mr. Desaunier, aye. Ms. Ross. Aye. Ms. Ross, aye. Mr. Nagus. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Burgess. Votes no. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rushenthaler. Yes. Mr. Rushenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. No. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Chairman. Um, aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. And um, Ms. Skin, how did, I think she, uh, did Ms. Ross vote? Yeah, Ms. Ross voted, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know where Ms. Kimlin went to, but um, in any event, um, I think we, I, we, we, yeah, yeah, so we, anyway, um, yeah, well, why don't we just, we, well, whatever, um, we can't find her. So anyway, the clerk will report the total. Seven yeas, four nays. And the um, uh, motion is agreed to, and um, I will carry for the majority. Mr. Speck will do it for the minority. So that's it. So without objection, uh, the committee uh, is adjourned.